Welcome to the E-Commerce Profits Podcast, where we feature top founders and experts in the e-commerce industry and take an in-depth look at the struggles and successes in growing e-commerce brands profitably. Josh Chin here. I'm the host of the E-Commerce Profits Podcast, where we feature top experts and founders in the e-commerce industry, and we go behind the scenes of the struggles and successes in growing a brand. Now, this episode is brought to you by Kronos Agency. If you run a direct-to-consumer e-commerce brand that is, that is ready to scale and to double your customer lifetime value through retention marketing, Kronos is your company. We have helped hundreds of brands scale profits with email, SMS, and mobile push marketing while getting an average of 3,500% ROI from our efforts. We've worked with brands like the Udi, Truly Beauty, Elias Skin, and many more. The next step is to email us at sales at chronos.agency, or you can go to chronos.agency to find out more. Today's guest is Lauren Schwartz. She's the founder and creative director of The Loft 325. Lauren has been a highly sought after creative strategist and digital marketing thought leader in the e com space, who has worked with disruptive D2C brands such as ColourPop, Love Wellness. APL, Snow Teeth Whitening, Born Primitive, Top Socks, and many, many more um, incredible, incredible brands. She is a design professional by trade with over 15 years of experience in design, with the past eight years being in digital marketing and e-commerce. And she is an expert when it comes to designing creatives that not only look good, but convert incredibly well. So Lauren, I'm excited to have you on. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks, Josh, for having me. <laughs> so, Lauren, tell us a little bit more about um, why you chose the design field and why you stuck with it over the past 15 years. And we talked about this. It's a it's a it's a long time that 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 perseverance in in one discipline <laughs> is something that I, I think very few people truly. Um, recognize and truly appreciate, uh, but it does pay off in in multiple folds. So tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah. So I, you know, I started, uh, my mom and dad have always been like super into art and I've always really loved art myself. And um, I just, you know, kind of wanted to, I wanted to pursue that passion um, out of college. And I, you know, at first I thought I wanted to be a marine biologist <laughs> and then decided oh, to man. switch gears and uh, really just okay. go for my passion, which was art. And, um, you know, started working um, and doing multimedia web design. So, so I, you know, I graduated back in like 2004 and obviously like <laughs> e-commerce was, it was there, but like, it wasn't as like it is now. So, you know, I definitely started out learning hand coding, um, and designing websites, you know, just basic HTML. Um, and just really kind of fell in love with like the digital side of things. I just could tell that like things were going to start moving in this path and that it was something that I was really excited about. Um, so, you know, just kind of, learned a lot of things along the way. I actually stepped away from the digital side of things for a while and started doing clothing design um, and worked for some pretty big brands doing accessory and apparel design. Um, but the clothing space was just it's crazy and I didn't necessarily want to be in that forever. So came back to digital and really just started going from there. Did everything from landing pages, email marketing, and now where I'm at, where I truly love what I'm doing, which is paid advertising. Um, I just love the, I love the way that it changes so quickly and you have to adapt so fast. It's just always such a fun thing to do of learning what's going to happen and learning the platforms and just really trying to figure out how they work and how to make everything successful. So, um, yeah, it's been, it's been a long, <laughs> long career path, but I finally think I found what I really enjoy doing. <laughs> just just on a, on a personal note, what what are some of the um what, what are some of your favorite um, pivoting moments in your career that kind of looking back at it, that decision at that moment changed everything for you? Were there any such moments in your? In yeah, your I mean, I want to say like I you know I was so young when I started. I mean, I started doing this when I was 
1920. And so, what? yeah. So just even being then like that young, you know, just there were so many things that happened. And then obviously as I've gotten older, um, you know, I thought like, oh, I wanted to be an apparel designer and I want to do this. And really like, I think I just like the landscape of being in digital marketing. Like I loved going onto people's web pages and just seeing like how web design, like was so different and how it's evolved even from when I went to school um that I think like finally like honestly like I lost my job on working at an apparel company and then I was like you know what I don't want to do this like this is <laughs> this is not my path and I think that was kind of like the path for me that kind of gave me that kick in the butt of like okay well obviously like you just need to go back to what you're you're really good at which is like the digital space e-commerce you know that that whole side is where I really kind of fell in love with design Lauren, talk to me about the, the 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 recent changes. Now, iOS 15, as of this recording, it's been out for almost two months now, about one and a yeah. half months. And I, iOS 14.5 has been out for way longer than that. Um, I've been told, and I, I'm definitely not in, in the paid uh, performance space, um, I've been told that creatives and specifically high volume rapid testing creatives is going to be incredibly important moving into the post iOS 15 and iOS world. Is that true? And <laughs> what, what's your, what, what are your, what's your take on that? Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, the way the landscape of Facebook has definitely changed um, ever since all the iOS updates. Um, I think before, you know, it was very much, you know, even when I was working at the agency, it was very much like, okay, like media buyers, have to be really good at our buying you have to figure out the audiences but really like it was always something that creative is what you see first and creative is what grabs your attention and so i think the biggest thing and i think more marketers now are realizing that creative is so important because really like if you're not grabbing their attention if you're not getting them to engage with what you're doing then like really you're going to lose like you're going to lose them so I think like with all of the updates, it just really made it that much more clear that people need to really start focusing on their creative and not necessarily just throwing everything in there and like hoping that it works, but really being strategic about the way that they're planning their creative, the way they're talking about their brand, the way that they're basically doing everything, you know, from top of the funnel to bottom of the funnel. Like there really has to be a strategy when it comes to creative and making sure that you're testing in a very um thoughtful way i think is what is making you know the new ios update so important especially for creatives is that you just you have to make sure that you're testing everything in a very thoughtful manner because it there is a strategy to it and you have to make sure that your creatives are going to work uh, let, let me hear your approach from the point of view of um let's say three categories of of d2c brands those that are 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 kind of figuring out product market fit, those are below, mm -hmm. I would say below, say, um, 500 to 800 grand a year. Those that are mm -hmm. above five, 800 grand a year to five mil, the, I, I suppose, startups and the <laughs> scale ups five mil and beyond. Um, I, is, yeah. is that, is that segmentation accurate and, and appropriate? But what I'm trying to get to is what kind of approaches and what kind of uh, a thought process of philosophy are you are you taking uh, with each of these segments? Yeah, so I think for you know for the ones that are on the the much smaller scale, um, you know, there's a lot of times that I have clients that come to me and they don't have a huge ad budget. Um, they just got their product out there, like it's it's still very new. They don't really have a great organic reach. Mm -hmm. And I tell, usually tell a lot of those, those potential clients, like, I think you need to build your organic first. You need to make sure that you're starting to build an audience before you even start doing anything with paid social, because really if like, you don't have a good organic reach, then you really have nothing to sell your product to. Like you don't know who your audiences are. You don't know who you're really targeting. And really you're going to, you're going to burn money on Facebook because it's mm. just, you don't have enough you don't have enough information to, I think, really make your brand super successful. And I feel like you're going to spend so much time and money testing that really you're going to burn up your ad budget really fast. So 
I always try to give those kind of smaller scale clients, like build your organic, make sure that everything's working, like try to get that following and then start testing with creative or with uh, Facebook. Um, right. And then as you kind of move into things, like obviously kind of the middle grade clients, um, they already have a pretty good organic. They're already building, um, you know, they've already tested some ads. I think the biggest thing for them is just really trying to pinpoint who their particular audience is, who they're trying to sell to, and really just nail that down and make it make it impactful. You know, obviously, like you want to chart, you want to get a higher AOV, you want to have long lasting customers, you want to get people coming back. Um, because really like those people that are going to keep coming back, they're going to start talking about your product. They're going to start sharing it with friends, which then is going to make it more beneficial for those people who are, you're trying to prospect because there is more, you know, of the reviews and everything. So with them, it's more just like making sure you're continuing to stay where you are, like continuing to, to try and find new audiences, test new audiences. Um, and then the clients that want to scale, I think for them, it's really, again, like, they already know who their audience is, but now they need to probably find more audiences and they need to find new potential people. So it's taking the learnings that we've had that we've done in the past and really trying to mm-hmm. figure out how do we reposition ourselves to become that kind of new shiny brand for these people that need to scale. And so it, it's like very, like there's so many different ways of kind of thinking about it. And um, there's so there's so much that goes into it that, I think it's just, there's a lot of data that's out there that you really have to pay attention to. And I think once you understand your data and kind of where you're at, you can start to figure out new audiences, new angles, new, you know, ways to test and like really scale your brand. Lauren, let's, let's take a step back with, um, with, with what you suggested. That's, that's really unique. Um, Taking an organic route first before spending anything on anything on ads, especially when you have a a small budget to begin with. Um, what is the best approach to to or, organic um, creatives and or organic uh, reach in, in general? N- knowing that Facebook's organic reach and Instagram's organic reach isn't necessarily the best um, for for DC brands or any brands for that matter. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think like just with the rise of video and TikTok and just mm-hmm. all these other platforms, like I really think that, you know, and again, this is just my opinion, but I think that a lot of brands, they, you know, like they've been on Facebook, they've been on Instagram, but there's just different ways of kind of talking to your audience on all these different platforms and making sure that you're just being very native and very authentic to the people that you're talking to, I think is a way to kind of like get your, your brand out there and really start to like grow your brand, especially on TikTok. I think, I mean, TikTok is growing and there's more and more people that are coming onto it, but you're going to be found faster on TikTok than you are on Instagram and Facebook. And Mm -hmm. so I definitely think like, even with an organic kind of search, like definitely get your brand onto TikTok because I think that it's something that could be super beneficial for smaller brands because you don't need a huge budget to be on it. Um, you can make all these, you know, great content, you know, pieces and you're going to get found a lot faster and it's just an easier way to get noticed as opposed to like going on to Instagram and Facebook where it is a lot harder to be found. Makes sense. One of my favorite, my, one of my, my, my team's uh, favorite, type of creatives uh for for for, for the email uh, channel is um actually ugc um yeah stuff with a face <laughs> on it stuff of people using product anything that's ugc performs incredibly yeah. well as an email um and i know that's uh that's that's true uh with paid uh channels as well um could could you share a little bit about why that's the case and maybe some of the examples you've seen done well Yeah. Um, I think, you know, again, UGC is just, there's so many ways to go about it. And I think the reason why user generated content does so well is because it looks native to the platform. Um, there's so many great content creators out there, micro influencers that really know how to shoot this sort of content. And I, so I think the reason why it just does so well is because it's so you can engage with it so much. Um, and it's so interesting to watch. I mean, 
you know, you can go on reels on IG or stories. And I mean, people just get lost in those, like they'll just scroll through those for hours. And, you know, it's the same thing with TikTok, like people will be on TikTok for hours, they don't necessarily need to be doing anything, but they'll just sit there and get lost in it. And so I think because it just looks so native to the feed, and it just looks authentic and organic. um, It just looks like someone sharing a, you know, a story with their friend. I think that's why it does so well, you know, you can you can definitely tell the higher paid content creators, or you can tell like high produced um, UGC. And mm-hmm. yes, that does do well. But I think the ones where it just looks very native and organic always do so much better. Because again, it looks like it's just in your feed. And it looks like you're just scrolling through and someone's telling you about our product. So um, I think that's why user generated content does so well. Lauren, just latching onto that, I, I know that uh, lots of brands are kind of caught up with the quality of creators and how pretty it looks and how grand it looks. Um, but kind of paying attention to the 80-20 rule, the Pareto principle, I understand that from, from observation that the first 10% or the first couple of seconds of a video or what you would call the hook is way more yeah. important than the entire video itself. Is is that true? And can you speak to that a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think the hook is what's obviously going to grab people as they scroll through the feed. So as you're scrolling through the feed, I think the best thing to do is like, if someone, if something pops out of you, or if there's large text, or if someone, you know, swipes and does something like you're going to stop and be like, Oh, what is this? And I do think that the first three seconds are super important, but I also think that like, you have to make sure you're rounding out your ad as well so that yes, you want to grab their attention, but you also want to get them to purchase too. So like, Mm. there are a lot of people that talk about the first three seconds, the first three seconds, like you have to get them to, you know, to hook you in. But I do also believe that you have to make sure that your ad is still informational enough and still can engage enough where people will want to watch the whole thing. I mean, ultimately you want to have someone watch more than three seconds, you know, like, yeah, yeah, I can get you to the site and I can get you to click, but like, I still want to tell you about this product. I want to tell you about the features and benefits. So I always Mm. say like, yes, the hook is important, but what, but it's also, but what happens after the hook, you know, like, how do I get them to stay and how do I get them to, you know, want to engage with my, my brand even more. And, and to me, like, I personally like to go more than three seconds. Like if I can get someone to watch my ad for five seconds, then like I've crushed my ad. Like I've done a really good job because I got them past the hook and I got them to watch much longer. So they've already engaged with my ad much longer than, you know, first three seconds or first second and then clicking. Um, so yeah, I do believe that it is important, but I also believe that you should pay attention to the the whole ad and what happens after those three seconds. Makes sense. And you talk a little bit about success and kind of the metrics. And you, you mentioned that if, if someone watches beyond that first three seconds, that's that's a great that's a great uh, success. What what, what kind of um, leading indicators or, or just indicators that you that you look at for uh, to determine if an ad is successful? If a, if a creative is working or not. In, in my mind, I'm just thinking, all right, revenue is the number one. But often right. when, when it comes down to revenue, it's a little bit too late, especially if it's like top of funnel. Um, yeah. Uh, we're looking at revenue. Uh, by the time revenue comes, it's way too much that has been spent. So what right. is that kind of the, the thought process behind the metrics? Yeah. So again, I, I do feel like obviously the first three seconds is super important. Um, making sure that, you know, you're getting people again, longer than the first three seconds. So usually what I kind of look at is, um, the click through rate. I look through, um, the impressions and, um, like the video, the video watch time with the average video watch time. Uh, what are the, the website purchases? Like, obviously like our job is to get people to click obviously on the Mm -hmm. ad, but then we also have to get them to convert. And so there's a lot of times when, you know, you'll get someone to the landing page, but then nothing will happen. And then at that point you're like, okay, was it the ad? Is it the home or is it the landing page? Like 
what what misstep happened in between them clicking to not purchasing? Like, is it the checkout process? So I think there's just a lot of things that go into figuring out like how everything works. But truthfully, mm-hmm. like my biggest thing is always looking at the click through rate um, and then looking at the the average watch time and um, the impressions and how like everything kind of goes together because really that's going to show me like how much are they engaging with my ad. And if I can get them engaged longer than the three seconds, then like, again, like I've, I've done my job. Like I've, I've gotten them to a point where like they're, they're interested enough to probably purchase after clicking through and going to the website. Perfect. Lauren, quick fire questions. Um, favorite books that you're reading right now or that you've recently looked at? <laughs> Honestly, I'm actually rereading the Harry Potter books right now. <laughs> nice. Nice. I like, I don't know, like for some reason I got my daughter, you know, she's eight and she wanted to start watching them. And yeah, so I started rereading those again. I forgot how good they are. Good storytelling. Really, really yeah. high quality really storytelling. Good storytelling. Yeah. Agreed. <laughs> Favorite podcasts, except for e-commerce profits podcast. <laughs> other than this one yeah. um oh man i feel like i have so many um shoot i honestly can't name one i'll be honest like i listen to a lot of different ones um i listen to like yeah i listen to a lot of them there's one that i i do listen to the most and it's called gold digger um but they yeah i honestly have too many to name so that's a hard it. question. <laughs> it, 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 it definitely is. Um, best advice that you have been given? Ooh, that's a good question too. Um, I, you know, it's funny. I think as I've kind of been going through this, like the last 15 years, like I have a friend who she, she's just one of my really good friends. And honestly, she just tells me all the time, like, keep your head down, do a good job, be a good person and, you know, good things will happen. And truthfully, like it sounds so cliche and and dumb, but like, it's really true. Like I feel like hard work and, you know, just being a kind person and very transparent, Mm -hmm. I think is what has really helped me get to where I am. So I, I do take that, you know, very, I do take that to heart. Like I really do try to be, be that, that person. I agree. I agree. Um, Favorite tools, tools? work tools or productivity <laughs> tools or anything that makes your life better? Yeah, um, Asana is definitely my biggest. I love Asana, Slack, um, Superhuman, which is like the best email platform. Email I love, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love so seeing it when my thing is cleared out. I'm like, oh my gosh, best day Inbox ever. zero. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got a weekly streak of. Two. <laughs> um, <laughs> awesome. Lauren, brands that you are a pers- you're personally a fan of, that you're a customer of, or just um, that you like? Yeah, I mean, oh gosh, again, like I, now that we've been, now that I work at home all the time, definitely like yoga pants brands are really good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Definitely have like a fan of like athleisure wear. Yeah, comfort. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I agree. Um, yeah. So anything like athletes where I actually used to work, uh, Feet was one of my clients and they honestly make the best sweatshirts and mm-hmm. joggers I think I've ever worn in my whole life. Like I love them. They're so comfortable. Uh, what how do you how do you spell it? Feet? Feet. F E A T. Feet. It's feetclothing.com, guys. Go check them out. <laughs> <laughs> you got a first uh let me see beat oh they have the stuff for women and men so mm-hmm. definitely go check them out yeah awesome. they're seriously they're so comfortable they're like the most comfortable pants and clothes <laughs> i've been i've been on hunts for just comfort all like all the time because that's that's my number one thing i don't care how i look as long as i'm if i'm uncomfortable and yeah. i'm like decent enough looking exactly <laughs> yeah even when i'm outside which can be a bad thing sometimes um 
Lauren, what's the best way for people to connect with you and contact you if they're interested to find out more about what you do and uh, potentially work with you if you have the capacity to take on clients? <laughs> yeah. Um, again, my my uh, web address is theloft325.com. Um, Instagram is at theloft325. Um, anything with that handle, you you can find me. And I'm always open to answering any questions in my DMs. I, I love when people ask me questions. So yeah, let them. Awesome. And guys, <laughs> don't don't go don't go uh, knocking Lauren's door at the, this point in time. She's packed to the brim. So uh, get on a waiting list. Definitely definitely shoot her a text, but don't expect uh, uh, to to get on the client roster immediately. Um, Lauren, I, I, I forgot to ask you this, but three, two, five, what does that mean? Yeah. So I actually, um, the law three, two, five came from when I lived in orange. Um, my husband and I, we lived in a small back house in orange. Um, it was literally like a loft. It was like less than 800 square feet and the address was three, two, five. So that was kind of where like the business started and I, it just kind of stuck with me and just kept it from the time <laughs> nice i love that story lauren thank you so much yeah. for being on the show it's been fun yeah thanks so much josh <laughs> it was great thanks for listening to the e-commerce profits podcast we'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get notified of future episodes